Part one. One. You will hear three conversations: the first and the third between two students, and the second between a student and a clerk. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hi, it's Mike, isn't it? Yes, and you're Phoebe. Phoebe, right? Where are you headed? I'm looking for the main hall. So am I. Are you going there to register for next year? Yes, I was told to go to administrations and fill in an application form. That's what I'm about to do. I went to information, and they told me it was at the end of this corridor. Then we have to turn left and immediately right. That should lead us to the exit, where opposite we should find the entrance to ground level main hall. It's a big old red building. From there, we need to go to the first level. And then follow the signs. Apparently, it's the second office opposite the foyer. It would be pretty hard to miss. That sounds easy. It shouldn't be too hard to find. Well, since we're both heading in that direction, let's go together. Hopefully, it won't take too long. I haven't had anything to eat, and I'm starving. Me too. Well, how about I go to the canteen and get us something while you make your way to the main hall? I'm sure there's going to be quite a wait. There always is. I can meet you there. Sounds like a good plan. What do you want me to get you? Um, how about a chicken and salad roll and a drink? Okay. What if they don't have a chicken and salad roll? Anything similar like ham and salad, or just plain salad and cheese. Oh, and don't forget the drink. I feel so dehydrated. No problem. What type of drink? I don't know.、Um, How about a Coke? No, nothing like that. Something healthier. An orange juice? They're usually full of sugar unless you get it freshly squeezed. Water? Yes, that's perfect. Here, take two pounds. That should cover it. If it's more, I'll give it to you when you get back. I only have a twenty, and you know that they get cranky if you give them large notes. Okay. See you in five minutes. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. First year economics. I just have to fill out this form for our records. What's your name? Phoebe Payne. Can you spell that for me? Sure. P H O E B E P A Y N E. Your address? Six. Wainwright Avenue. That's W A I N R I G H T, Nottingham. Nottingham. And your phone number? It's not connected yet. I've just moved in. Okay. When you get your phone connected, contact us. I'll just make a note that your phone number is to be advised. I'll do that. What course were you doing? Law? No, economics. First year. First year economics. Yes, that's right. Okay, take this card across to the economics department and get it stamped, and then you need to come back here to pay your fees. I've made an arrangement to pay in installments. Do you have any documentation verifying that? Yes, I have a statement from administration. Okay, when you return, we'll have a look at it. Thank you very much. Here you are. It was quicker than I thought. 
but I have to get this card stamped and return here to organise my fees. That's good. It means that I won't have to wait long either. How did you get on? What with? Oh, the food. Well, there wasn't much left, so I got you a cheese and tomato sandwich and water. That's fine. Do I owe you any more? No, I need to give you back three pounds. But I only gave you two. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought you gave me a fiver. OK, so we're square. So what do I have to do? Go to the desk and give your personal details. Then they'll give you a card that you need to take to your faculty. What's your major? Environmental science. OK, so you'll have to take the card to the environmental science faculty and get the card stamped, return to administration in the main hall and organise your fees. And that's it? Yes, that means you're registered. Then we receive a letter with the details of our course where we'll be informed to go to the notice board or online to find out when and where our lectures are. OK. Let's have this bite to eat first. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of an interview between Dr. Hilsden, a member of staff on a fashion design course, and a student, Julia, who is applying to do the course. First, look at questions 11 to 13. Right, Julia. So, from your CV and portfolio, and what you've already told me, you seem to be very much the sort of person we're looking for on the postgraduate course. So tell me, you finished your fashion design course in London four years ago. Did you think of carrying straight on and doing a higher degree at the time? Yes, but there were financial pressures. So I ended up working in the retail industry, as you can see from my CV. Mm -hmm. And actually, it was a very useful experience. Mm. In what way? Well, I was lucky to get the job with Fashion Now. They're a big store. And one of my priorities was to get as much experience as possible in different areas. So that was good because I had the chance to work in lots of different departments. And having direct contact with the customers meant I was able to see how they reacted to innovation, uh, to new fashion ideas. Because with Fashion Now, a designer might show something in New York or Milan, and there'll be something similar in the shop within weeks. So that was probably the most useful thing for me. Right. And so what's made you decide to do a postgraduate course now? Um, well, while I enjoyed working at Fashion Now, and I learned a lot there, I felt, uh, well, the way forward would have been to develop my managerial skills, rather than my skills in fashion design, and I'm not sure that's what I want to do. Mm, yes. When I was doing my degree in London, I'd been interested in women's wear, but I know that there's been a lot of work done in areas like new fabric construction, and though I'm not intending to go too deeply into the technology, I'd be very interested in looking at how new fabrics could be used in children's wear. So I'd like the chance to pursue that line. Yes, good. And are you at all concerned about what it's going to be like coming back into an academic context after being away from it for several years? No, I'm looking forward to it. Huh. 
But I'm basically more interested in the application than the theory, or at least that's what I've found so far. And I'm hoping the course will give me the contacts and skills I need eventually to set up my own enterprise. I'm particularly interested by the overseas links that the department has. Yes, many of our students look overseas or to international companies for sponsorship of their projects. Before the talk continues, look at questions 14 to 20. As you listen to the second part of the talk, answer the questions. And the facilities here look excellent. I just went to look at the library. It's really impressive. There's so much room compared with the one at my old university. Yes, most students find it's a good place to study. Mm. And there are link-ups to other universities, of course, and all the usual electronic sources. The staff run an information skills program, which we recommend all postgraduates do in the first week or two. Design students find these special collections particularly useful. Yes. Then we have a separate computer centre, which has its own academic coordinator, Tim Spender. He's got a background in art design, and the ethos of the centre is that it's a studio for innovation and creativity, rather than a computer laboratory. Oh, right. I liked the study spaces where students can sit and discuss work together. Very useful for joint projects. We always had to do that sort of thing in the cafeteria when I was an undergraduate. <laughs> and I read in the brochure that there's a separate resource for photography. Yes, it's called Photo Media. It's not just for photography, but things like digital imaging and new media. It's a resource for all our students, not just fashion design and we encourage students to work there, producing work that crosses disciplinary boundaries. It's well used. In fact, it's doubled in size since it was set up three years ago. And we also have an offshoot from that, which is called time-based media. This is for students who want to develop their ideas in the area of the moving image or sound. That's in a new building that was specially built for it just last year. But there are plans to expand it, as the present facilities are overstretched already. Right. Now, uh, is there anything you'd like to ask about the course itself? Um, I know it's a combination of taught modules and a specialist project, mm -hmm. but how does assessment fit in? Well, uh, as you'd expect on a course of this nature, it's an ongoing process. The degree course has four stages, and there are what we call progress reviews at the end of each of the first three. Then the final assessment is based on your project. You have to produce a report, which is a critical reflection on your work. And is there some sort of fashion show? There's an exhibition. The projects aren't all focused on clothes as such. Some are more experimental, so that seems more appropriate. We ask representatives of fashion companies along, and it's usually well attended. Right. And another thing I wanted to ask... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a discussion between two students and their teacher on a planned charity event. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. So, are you making any progress with your plans for our annual charity event? I guess first things first, have you decided what charity it will be in aid of this year? We're thinking about Help the Children Africa, sir. Well, that's Mark's idea, sir. But I myself prefer a local charity called The Meals on Wheels. I'd have to agree with Laura on this one, Mark. After all, we're supposed to be giving back to the local community. And although helping African children is a very worthy cause, it's a little outside our remit. That settles it, I guess. Moving on from the beneficiary question, have you made a decision on what type of event it will be? Yes, we plan on doing something a little different this year. We're calling the event Balloonathon. Basically, we're going to offer balloons for sale to all the students. Balloons? I don't see where you're going with this. Why would they want to buy a balloon? Well, here's the thing. We don't actually give them the balloon. Instead, we'll write their name on it along with the special phone number and then we'll release all the balloons into the air. When they fall to the ground, if a person finds one and rings a special number, then both he and the student who bought the balloon will win a gift voucher. That sounds like an excellent idea, guys. Well thought out. This balloonathon has a real novelty value attached to it, don't you think? Exactly what we said, sir. The only drawback is that the gas you put into the balloons is rather expensive. How much? About £20 per canister, and we'll need about 10 And how many balloons are you planning to blow up? Well, there are over a 1,000 students in the school, so if even one-third of the students buy one, we'd need about 350 balloons. We've decided to order 500 so we don't run out. The good thing is we can return the canisters of gas if we don't use them, and the balloons aren't expensive, so there's no real risk of us spending a lot of money without getting a good return. You two have really thought this one out. I'm impressed. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Thank you, sir. So, how much money do you think we can raise? Well, each balloon costs about 1p, and when it's filled with gas, it's going to cost us about 50 pence. We reckon that if we sell our balloons at a price of £1.50, and we sell all 500 of them, we'll end up making a profit of £1 per balloon. So that's £500 in total. That's fantastic. And it gets better, sir. We've secured a sponsor for our event who's going to give us £1,000. How did you find a sponsor? The balloon company we approached about buying the balloons asked us if we'd be interested in letting them sponsor us too. What's in it for them? They're going to print their logo on every balloon. I think you've done a good deal there. Thank you, sir. So, do we have your approval to confirm our order? Absolutely. But, you know, I think we can sell more balloons if we set our minds to it. So, why not order double the amount? A thousand instead of five hundred. We're going to need more than ten canisters of gas, then. Double the amount, presumably. Correct. OK. Let's go for it. Let's make this year's charity event our most successful Ever. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. 
Part 4. You will hear a lecturer in education talking about some experiments done in the USA to investigate the effects of reducing class sizes. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on pages 71 and 72. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. All over the world, there are passionate arguments going on about how educational systems can be improved. And of all the ideas for improving education, few are as simple or attractive as reducing the number of pupils per teacher. It seems like common sense. But do these ideas have any theoretical basis? Today, I want to look at the situation in the USA and at some of the research that has been done here in America on the effects of reducing class sizes. In the last couple of decades or so, there has been considerable concern in the United States over educational standards here, following revelations that the country's secondary school students perform poorly relative to many Asian and European students. In addition... Statistics have shown that students in the nation's lower-income schools in the urban areas have achievement levels far below those of middle-class and upper-middle-class schools. So would reducing class sizes solve these problems? Well, we have to remember that it does have one obvious drawback. It's expensive. It requires more teachers and possibly more classrooms, equipment, and so on. On the other hand, If smaller classes really do work, the eventual economic benefits could be huge. Better education would mean that workers did their jobs more efficiently, saving the country millions of dollars. It would also mean that people were better informed about their health, bringing savings in things like medical costs and days off sick. So what reliable information do we have about the effects of reducing class sizes, There's plenty of anecdotal evidence about the effect on students' behavior, but what reliable evidence do we have for this? Let's have a look at three research projects that have been carried out in the USA in the last couple of decades or so. The first study I'm going to look at took place in the state of Tennessee in the late 1980s. It involved some 70 schools. In its first year, about 6,400 students were involved, and by the end of the study, four years later, the total number involved had grown to 12,000. What happened was that students entering kindergarten were randomly assigned to either small classes of 13 to 17 students or regular-sized classes of 22 to 26. The students remained in whatever category they had been assigned to through the third grade, And then, after that, they joined a regular classroom. After the study ended in 1989, researchers conducted dozens of analyses of the data. Researchers agree that there was significant benefit for students in attending smaller classes, and it also appears that the beneficial effect was stronger for minority students. However, there's no agreement on the implications of this. We still don't know the answer to questions like how long students have to be in smaller classes to get a benefit, and how big that benefit is, for example. The second project was much larger and took place in California. Like the Tennessee study, it focused on students from kindergarten through to grade three. But in this case, all schools throughout the state were involved. The experiment is still continuing, but results have been very inconclusive with very little improvement noted. And the project has, in fact, also had several negative aspects. 
it meant an increased demand for teachers in almost all California districts. So the better-paying districts got a lot of the best teachers, including a fair number that moved over from the poorer districts. And there were a lot of other problems with the project. For example, there weren't any effective procedures for evaluation. All in all, this project stands as a model of what not to do in a major research project. A third initiative took place in the state of Wisconsin at around the same time as the California project began, and it's interesting to compare the two. The Wisconsin project was small. Class sizes were reduced in just 14 schools, but it was noteworthy because it targeted schools at which a significant proportion of the students were from poor families, compared with California's one-size-fits-all approach. Analysts have found that the results are very similar to the Tennessee Project, with students making gains that are statistically significant and that are considerably larger than those calculated for the California Initiative. Now, I'd like to apply some of these ideas to the latest... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Welcome to our channel. Today in this video, I'll be discussing with you writing task 2 and the question for today is Information technology is changing many aspects of our lives and now dominates our home, leisure and work activities. To what extent do the benefit of information technology out with the disadvantages? So the question is about advantages and disadvantages of information technology as it is changing every aspect. I can say every aspect of our life, like uh, it is dominating now in our home, leisure, I mean, free time also we use these things and for work activities as well. So we have to tell that um, what are the advantages and what are the disadvantages of thing, this information technology and we also have to tell that which is more benefits or disadvantages. Let's start with the introduction. In recent decades, information technology has altered practically every area. Altered means has changed uh, practically every area of people's life. Workplaces, shopping, music, movie, television, photography, travel, transportation, and long distance communication are just a few examples of how things have changed or how things have evolved. It does, without a doubt, have drawbacks. Means no doubt, it has some drawbacks. But the benefits significantly surpass the downfall. So the benefits means the advantages uh, significantly surpass means uh, outweigh the disadvantages means downfalls. So in the body paragraph 1 we will be discussing about the advantages. In body paragraph 2 we will be discussing some of its lacks uh, means uh, cones or uh, disadvantages. And then we will be just re um, reiterating this or concluding this. There are numerous advantages of using information technology. First and the foremost, it has altered, it has changed, evolved the scope of research. Early years, students had to go to the library and search many articles for any information. Like This is true that a student has to go to the libraries and they have to search a lot of uh, things or a lot of articles for any kind of information. However, due to technological advancements, they can now assess any information in a fraction of seconds. So they can uh, find any of the information just in few seconds, saving time and efforts. This will definitely save their time as well as efforts. Furthermore, during pandemics such as COVID-19, students could attend online classes from the comfort of their own homes. So this, this was possible only because of information technology. Apart from that, it has opened up new opportunities for individuals resulting in the discovery of numerous new occupations which has raised the employment rate and nation's economy. So instead of uh, these things, it has also opened new avenues, we can say new uh, job opportunities for individuals resulting in 
new occupations uh, it has opened new, as we are saying that it has opened new avenues so that means new jobs which has raised the employment rate as well as nation economy so it has not only boosted the economies uh, nation's economy but also the uh, it has also increased the employment rate additionally because the internet is widespread people may enjoy entertainment on their phones laptops and television they can also download music movies and games for their amusements for their uh, you know leisure activities for their time pass they can download these things as well this is all possible because of information technology now on the flip side if we talk about some of the disadvantages on the flip side everything in excess is harmful right therefore over exposing technology or over use of technology can result in serious health problems such as obesity heart problem eye strain muscular disorder and deafness so these could be some of the problems which one suffer if he or she overuse the technology in addition technology related waste can pollute the environment making people sick so the waste can also you know uh, pollute the environment as well which can result in the bad health of the people so making people sick while also harming the ecosystem furthermore individuals are distancing themselves from the outside world as they are preoccupied with mobile phones and laptops and have forgotten about the people around them so whenever they get free time they just involve themselves in the mobile phones or laptops for uh, you know passing their time as well and forgetting about the people around them now it's the conclusion to summarize information technology advancements undeniably have changed our world dramatically affecting almost every part of our everyday life from entertainment to business but not without flaws means undoubtedly it has a lot of a lot of uh, advantages but a few of flaws are there a few uh, uh, disadvantages are there hence if used precisely but if we use them if you with these things or if you if we use in uh, the technology in a precise way wisely its disadvantages can be overlooked so its disadvantages can be overlooked so this first for today if you like the video do hit the like button and subscribe to our channel i'll meet you in the next video till then bye bye